Stanford University. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Dick Luthi, and I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering and the director of this new NSF Engineering Research Center on uh, reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. Today, I'm going to be very brief. I'm kind of the warm up act here for Craig Criddle, who's going to give the real substance of, of the presentation today. But I wanted to give a little bit of overview about um, where we sit with respect to our water and what some of the opportunities are here in California. Um, I, I look at the situation today is that we have a special opportunity now for urban water. Uh, and if I look back on my career, uh, the last time I think there was a special opportunity for water was probably the late 60s, 1970, 1972 in that era. And what happened then? Well, it was uh, the publishing of uh, books like Silent Spring, uh, the Cuyahoga River caught on fire, uh, there was Earth Day, the founding of the EPA, and the Clean Water Act, all happening there within a few years. And so that was a special opportunity for water. And I think we're at the same point today, now some 40 plus years later, special opportunity. And why is that? Well, a lot of the infrastructure that was put in place at, in response to the uh, Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, it's now at the end of its service life. Uh, and of interest to you people on energy, uh, that technology that was put in place had an emphasis on capital costs, uh, not really on energy costs of operation. Um, we are experiencing water shortages. We're in a drought this year. We'll probably, uh, we got a little bit of rain today, but it, before it started raining, we only had five inches on campus here. Uh, so um, what do we see happening here in the far west, the southwest, Texas, Atlanta and parts of Florida. Uh, basically, we have areas with uh, uh, population increase and water scarcity. And the water scarcity is going to get worse with climate change. Uh, runoff will decrease, uh, not increase. So it's, you know, it's dry now. Well, it's going to get drier. Uh, also, in uh, all of this part of the country, we've been able to build the cities of the West, like us here in San Francisco or LA, San Diego, Phoenix and the like, by importing water from afar. And that's, uh, that's been to the detriment of ecosystems. And today we recognize that we need to leave water in uh, streams and rivers to provide ecosystem services. And that's a new claimant. So we have all of these things sort of coming together uh, that as I say, make a special opportunity for water. And I think this has uh, played a large role in why our center uh, was funded out of many proposals that the NSF had. Uh, you all are interested in energy, so I'll just skip uh, to a slide that looks at uh, the way we use energy in our water system. Uh, this shows a bunch of boxes here of uh, water supply and conveyance, water treatment, the distribution, in use, wastewater collection, uh, wastewater treatment, maybe reuse, and a final discharge. Running this whole system takes a lot of energy. Uh, and uh, so it comes from the supply, uh, from the user, and from the wastewater part of it. And when we look at reports from the California Energy Commission, uh, we see statements that 19% uh, of our electricity, some 30% of the natural gas, in the state is used to run this whole system. Uh, that's true. Uh, but there's a, that's, there's, there's a little bit more to the story. If we sort of break that down, uh, we see that this uh, electricity that's needed to power that whole system is in fact 19% of, of the electricity used in California. But an awful lot of that is with the end users, uh, about three quarters. Um, and that has to do with our water heaters and uh, pumps in our house and that kind of thing. That's not to say that the water supply and the wastewater treatment isn't important, it is. But it comes down to maybe on the order of 4% or you know, one quarter of 19%, something like that. So I'd like to um, just take a moment and, uh, and, and look at this water supply issue. Now, we're a little special right here in the Bay Area. 
in that our water supply, we're on a, the aqueduct that comes from a water reservoirs in the Yosemite National Park, the Hetch Hetchy system. The water runs downhill to us. It actually generates power for the city of San Francisco. It's a big source of revenue for them. But in other parts of the state, in the, in the south, uh, what happens with the state water project is that we're moving water from north to south and we're pumping over these hills here. Uh, so that takes a lot of energy. Um, we're, we're working against uh, uh, gravity in that case. Uh, and that's the case for the state water project, moving water from north to south. Uh, another example is the... Uh, Colorado River Aqueduct. Uh, this takes water uh, from uh, Parker Dam, and brings it through us. If, maybe if you've flown in an airplane over this area, you see a little line on the desert. Well, that's that aqueduct. Then you, there are five lift stations here, and eventually the water works its way to Los Angeles, and there's a diversion down to San Diego. That system takes uh, half of the power uh, from uh, Parker Dam to pump that water. There's another part of that power that goes off to push water towards, uh, towards Arizona. So what this means is when we look at the situation energy-wise between Northern and Southern California, there's uh, quite, a, quite a difference here. Uh, the supply conveyance, the water treatment, uh, uh, the distribution, or uh, excuse me, the, uh, the water treatment, the distribution, the wastewater treatment are all the same, but the supplies are much different. The energy needed to provide that water for Southern California is about three times what it is for us. So um, that, that presents an opportunity now, when you look at these energy costs here, to say, well, we could uh, use that, uh, we can do lots of things now in terms of if we're going to uh, invest that much energy into supplying water, we could, should think more about reusing water. And that's what... Uh, I'd like to talk about now is shifting gears just a teeny bit and say, let's look at the issue of, uh, of reuse of water. And I show here a city A and a city B. Uh, water comes from a reservoir, it gets used, it goes through a wastewater treatment plant, it gets discharged, it's taken by another city. That's a common story. Uh, and that process of uh, take, use, treat, uh, take, use, treat, uh, discharge, and the like. Um, we might call that a, a de facto reuse, meaning a sort of unplanned reuse, but it happens in inland areas all the time. What's, uh, what's gaining more attention is the idea of, uh, of short-circuiting this and reclaiming this water and putting it back towards the community from which it came. And in this case, it's, uh, we show us, the picture here shows uh, it going into a water reservoir and then from there to the city. We might call this a, a indirect portable reuse because there's a, a, a natural system component there. Uh, so this is, these are some of the trends that we see now uh, in which if, uh, where we have water short regions, there isn't enough water to go around, and the energy costs of uh, supplying water are, are, are great. So we can think more about these kinds of strategies. And in fact, they, they are occurring. Here in uh, uh, Palo Alto, we see examples of these purple pipe systems that take uh, reclaimed water from the water quality control plant and we use it for irrigation. So there's a growing familiarity uh, with uh, water reuse, in part through these kinds of examples. I want to point out another one. Uh, this particular picture here is of great interest to me. It's an ecosystem that was uh, restored with reclaimed water. Essentially, all the water that you see in this system is uh, reclaimed water. And this is the one place that I know of. It's over at uh, Pacifica at Calera Creek, where reclaimed water actually uh, uh, was used to restore an ecosystem. All those trees you see there, they're endangered species there now and walkways and the like. This is a great story, but it's very uncommon. It's a very uncommon story. And I see that as a place where there's lots of opportunity to do new things. In, in Los Angeles, uh, Orange County specifically, uh, 
wastewater is being highly treated to augment the um, uh, drinking water supply. And the way that's done is by microfiltration, reverse osmosis, then ultraviolet light disinfection with hydrogen peroxide. Now this water then is pumped into the ground and it spends some months in the ground and it's taken out. So this is an example of uh, a water reuse uh, where the um, energy costs to do this are actually a bit less than those energy costs of, uh, of importing water from Northern California. Um, or as the general manager would say, uh, water diversity in an arid region. Uh, not only does it make sense energetically, but in fact, uh, there really isn't uh, more water to sort of grab from the uh, uh, state water project. It's all been accounted for. So um, let's just look at a situation here then where we think about water reuse and wastewater. Craig will give some great examples here in just a moment. But um, when we use water, uh, some of it goes on our lawns for irrigation, and that's, that's sort of lost. But on average, uh, each day, uh, people generate about 75 gallons of uh, water. Uh, and I show here the cost then of, say, taking that water and upgrading it to approximately drinking water quality and comparing those costs with treated water from the Metropolitan uh, Water District, which is a big supplier in LA to a bunch of cities. And you look at those two costs, say, well, they're essentially the same. This is reclaimed water. Uh, this is water from the Metropolitan Water District. Now, when things get tight and you need to provide water for ecosystem services and the like, or you have climate change effects, you can't go to this group and say, I want more. There are too many competing needs. So what's the situation? If we looked at the wastewater in Southern California that currently goes to the ocean, for Los Angeles, Santa Ana, Santa Ana, San Diego, there's about, uh, these are funny units here, but it's about, uh, it's a big number, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm not gonna try to explain acre feet. It's just, it's, well, uh, this would, uh, this is what uh, currently the state water project uh, doesn't provide. Uh, these, these uh, uh, the Metropolitan Water District says we have so much claim on that water, well, they don't really get it all. So this could make up the difference. And in particular, this leaves water for other purposes. So there's a great potential there to, to reuse water for our uh, uh, domestic use. And this is an idea that's gaining in popularity. Now, this is the... Um, uh, a brief from an NRC report that was just issued in January. It's titled Water Reuse, the Potential for Expanding the Nation's Water Supply Through Reuse of Municipal Water. So this is an idea that's gaining traction, particularly in the area of indirect and direct portable water reuse, sort of going a step further than the purple pipe system and irrigation. Now this, this report came out in, uh, in January, and it's uh, it, it's given considerable attention. Uh, this is from the New York Times uh, on Friday, uh, front page below the fold. Uh, and the title is, As Yuck Factor Subsides, Treated Wastewater Flows from Taps. Well, um, San Diego is putting an experimental system to look at reclaimed water, a uh, million gallon a day system. And this is something new for San Diego because they rejected that 10 years ago. So this is an example of things moving along. Uh, I have just a couple more slides here, and that's that um, does it always take a crisis to move us forward in the area of doing things better and smarter with water? And so I refer back to Los Angeles in 2007 here, where uh, the Metropolitan Water District and the mayor's office said things had reached the boiling point in Los Angeles in terms of low snowpack, uh, driest year on record. Uh, 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 the judge in Fresno saying can't export water out of, the, um, out of the Bay Delta, limiting exports from there, and then provide, leaving water for environmental uh, mitigation in uh, Mono Lake and in uh, Owens Valley. And it was at that point then that Los Angeles said, you know, we need to do things differently. We should have a smart water grid. We should maximize water recycling, enhance stormwater capture, expand groundwater storage in the urban environment, and explore water transfers. All of these are themes 
for our engineering research center. I didn't go, I don't want to explain what all we're doing, but those map on perfectly. And now this is the slide I'll use to hand off to Craig Criddle, where it shows the water use on the Stanford campus. Uh, the red line is, uh, is what we get from the Hetch Hetchy system, uh, assuming we're not in drought. There was conservation, well this line goes up and down because uh, the blue is the annual use, it goes up and down because of irrigation. But the black line is the trend. There was conservation, uh, a lot of conservation measures put in on the Stanford campus, but we've sort of maxed that out. Now as we put on, in new buildings and new housings like this complex here, uh, what's happening? This is going to creep up. So the story that Craig will give, and the one that I want to leave you with, is that we want to plan for the future. We don't want to be uh, like Los Angeles and suddenly wake up and says, my gosh, we've reached the boiling point. We need to plan now for an eventuality, maybe like 10 or 15, 20 years out, where uh, this little black curve is going to go up, and that little red bar might actually come down. It will come down in a, in a, in a drought. And so how do we plan for that future? And I'm going to let Craig now pick it up from here and tell us ways that we can uh, harvest our um, wastewater and do it in a way that uh, doesn't require energy. But this particular picture for me is one of, uh, lets us demonstrate what's possible here on the Stanford campus and plan for the future. Okay? And we'll take questions. Right. Well, today I'm uh, happy to talk to you about this subject, and uh, Dick gave a great introduction uh, of the issues here relating water and energy. I'm going to go one step further beyond that. Uh, we're talking about wastewater and how, what it can do for energy. But I want to talk about solid waste as well and see, uh, see what larger picture there is there is, that we can uh, tap into potentially. See if I can learn how to operate this. Okay. So I'm going to talk about short-circuited cycles, wastewater as a resource. Uh, scale effects, and then uh, solid waste as a resource. That's the basic uh, set of themes. And uh, then we're going to try and tie it all together uh, through integrated waste recovery, or integrated resource recovery. So what do I mean by short circuit uh, cycles? What do I mean by that? Well, the water cycle is um, one that you're all very familiar with. And there's a cycle with, uh, where we have low quality water that uh, through the sun gets converted into high, uh, high quality water, a limited amount of that. And uh, when I talk about short circuit, uh, what we've been able to do is uh, effectively short circuit the cycle that way, right? <laughs> uh, that's, our, that's what we've succeeded in doing with our uh, systems. So, and the result is that the cycle isn't uh, being uh, restored fast enough. So we have situations like this one here in Bangladesh. And the carbon cycle is another one I'd like to think about. Uh, so we think of uh, the carbon cycle this way, uh, fixed carbon and gaseous carbon, very simple-minded approach. And uh, what we're very good at is this, right? We seem to be excellent at this. So we short-circuit that cycle uh, tremendously well, and uh, we're not fast enough getting it back uh, in balance. So we end up with these kind of situations. Then we have the nitrogen cycle. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is another one that's uh, very, it's critical to supporting uh, support of life on Earth. We have uh, gaseous nitrogen and uh, ammonia. I'll just think, divide the world up that simple way in terms of nitrogen. And we have the Haber-Bosch process, um, which is the way we've short-circuited this cycle to feed the world. Uh, this is a significant energy consumption here. Uh, I think I've read 2 to 3% of the energy uh, consumed for this process, fixing the nitrogen, taking nitrogen, hydrogen, and making ammonia. So we've short-circuited the cycle, and that's how we feed everybody. And then the problem is it's not fast enough going back, right? So again, uh, it's a cycle out of balance. <clears throat> and uh, essentially what that means is that those materials there at the bottom, the ammonia, the nitrate, uh, accumulate. And that, as a result of that, we end up with uh, eutrophication events, fish kills, and uh, various things that we all want to avoid. So a challenge that for everyone here in this room, I suppose, is that we, if we see if we can better align economic and environmental interests. How can we do that? <clears throat> so that they go the right way. Maybe we need to short circuit in reverse, right, from what's been happening, and generate uh, money and then, then, then it will be economically aligned, right, if we can do that. And jobs. 
Okay, so that's kind of the idea here. Let's reverse the cycles. So if we think about the water cycle, uh, it circulates a lot of water. 107,000 cubic kilometers per year uh, is just what the sun does. It's just amazing. Uh, great recirculation loop. We only need 1,600 cubic kilometers per year. What is going on? Why do we have any problem at all with water? Uh, what's the problem? That's the question. Well, the problem is that uh, where the water is, right? It's not where we need it. Okay, so many, many people live where there is very little fresh water. And uh, this is showing a couple of countries that you're familiar with, or countries, well, one state and one country, okay? And uh, we can see that big situation, the, the big difference between uh, north and south in these two countries, uh, or places. <laughs> So water-rich, uh, we have the water-rich south in, in, in uh, China and arid north, and the, and the opposite true in California, okay? So how do we deal with that issue? How have we traditionally dealt with that issue? Uh, the normal way that we've dealt with it is by moving the water from the places where it's, where it's abundant and to the areas where it's scarce to meet human needs. And so uh, we have the California aqueduct, which moves 2 billion cubic meters per year, and then the Chinese are building one that's going to move 45 billion cubic meters per year. Okay? And this is over, actually it's in excess of 2 kilowatt hours per cubic meter to move that water from north to south. So it's a big energy investment, Dick referred to that, the, the much larger triple the energy investment in water in, the, in Southern California compared to Northern California. So how can we align economic and environmental interests? That's a question. Okay. So treated wastewater effluent is a local source that can decrease the demand for imported water. Um, but typically, we just throw it away. So for example, if you go down to the city of Palo Alto, there's about 25 million gallons per day. And Phil Bubbles here, so he can testify. Phil, Phil's our partner at Palo Alto. Pardon me? Don't blame me. Yeah, uh, yeah so, but it's a, it's a lot of water every day, 25 million gallons. and. Uh, and what we mostly do with it is we throw it away. I mean, that's what we do with this treated water, okay? Uh, you can look at the value of this water in different ways. And uh, this is a summary that uh, Willy uh, Verstrada did. He's a Belgian engineer, a colleague. And he summarized the different resources that you can see in wastewater, domestic wastewater. And in this picture, you can see uh, organic soil conditioner, which would be organics that can be recovered, say, as compost or biochar, and the dollars per cubic meter of wastewater if you did that, and then the dollars per thousand gallons if you did that. And it gives you an idea of uh, the value of the organics in the water. The, meth the organics have converted to methane, what would they provide in terms of value? Uh, about 25 cents per thousand gallons, and um, nitrogen and phosphorus about 25 cents uh, up each per thousand gallons, or 25 cents per thousand gallons for nitrogen and five cents for phosphorus. And then last is water. The big winner is water. So water is uh, about a dollar uh, per thousand gallons or 33 cents per cubic meter. So uh, that is the high value um, material that we want to recover from uh, wastewater in general. But uh, of course, this is a really simplified way of thinking and economists will beat me up for presenting it so simply. There's really a lot of ways to think about resources. In reality, the value of a resource depends upon the cost of recovering it, of course right? Depends on the cost of adding any value to it and uh, moving it to where it's needed, right? And then the final sale price is what I was just talking about. So there's all these other elements to uh, the value of the resource. So if we just look at sale price, though, let's look at methane for, as an example, and I'm going to come back to this later in the talk. If you take about five kilograms of methane, you can make a kilogram of a bioplastic that's pretty valuable bioplastic. It sells for about four dollars a kilogram right now. You can make that a uh, little, uh, I got 470, but it's about $4, okay? So you can take that same amount of uh, methane and make energy out of it, and you'd make about 0.2 MBTU, and that's the selling price that I found on the web for that, for that, um, for ga natural gas right now is about that for the methane. So it'd be about 80 cents, the sale price. If we make fish food out of it, we can make, there's mi microorganisms will eat this methane. And uh, so we could make fish food or protein out of it, 
and it'd sell it for a dollar a kilogram. We'd make two kilograms of fish food if we, from that five kilograms of methane. We'd sell it for a dollar a kilogram and make two bucks. Or we could make methanol potentially in the future. This is something people are doing research on. And so I just costed it out to see what it, the value of that would be. But the big ones, um, are, it's interesting though, the, the same amount of resource um, could be processed in different ways to add value to it and to create uh, potentially uh, different markets. So we can say that uh, this resource recovery activity can be tailored to what a community might need or want or have a, have a market for, okay? So at what scale should different resources be recovered? What I mean by scale is uh, really, uh, uh, I have to define that. So um, you could think of the scale of a single building. It could be a, a dorm like here at Stanford, or it could be, I saw lots of high rises in, in Hong Kong recently that had two or 3,000 people in them, okay? Then you could, uh, if you go up scale, we'd have a cluster, and then you have small cities, homeowners associations, campuses, farms. A catchment would be, um, basically cities that share a, a common centralized wastewater treatment facility. And, um, and then you can go to this all the way up to the scale of a watershed. And uh, if you think about energy, the energy for transport, as we saw before in Dick's talk, moving water from north to south in, in California is an uh, energy intensive proposition. And so as you move, across, because you have to go over divides that separate watersheds, right? So that's a big energy to, to pump. So um, the, the, the alternative is to try to reuse water locally. And so as you go down the scale, of course, the, the energy then needed to move the water is getting less and less. This is a team of people that have been working on this um, issue for some time now. It's the, we call it the Stanford. We now just call ourselves the water team, I guess. And um, uh, I want to point out a, f a few people. My colleague, David Freiberg, is there. And, uh, He's a hydrologist and really is um, grounding us there in that. And uh, also I want to point out Marty Laporte uh, from Stanford Utilities and uh, Tom Zichterman from Stanford Utilities and Phil Bobel from City of Palo Alto, right, sitting right here. So um, for almost, almost two years, I think, we've been meeting every other week, right, trying to uh, get uh, ground truth our research so that it's uh, relevant. Okay, to the people who need to make these decisions about water and energy from waste and wastewater. So if we look at uh, the Palo Alto uh, catchment, here's a water balance. This is, our general approach has been to develop these water balances like this one. And you can see there's imported water is about 34 million gallons per day, groundwater three, surface water 0.5 million gallons per day. And a discharge is 24 million gallons per day roughly uh, to, the, to the bay. You can see by the size of the arrows which ones are the big contributors. So you see that Stanford is, is teeny. We are teeny compared to some of these other clusters in terms of the wastewater that we uh, contribute. If we have 50% reuse though, uh, you could imagine that you cut back, that what you discharge to the bay gets cut back by 50%. And you could uh, decrease the imported water by to 24 million gallons per day. So 29% decrease in the imported water potentially. Or you could, have, you could also have a significant decrease in the groundwater uh, drafts, and so the groundwater level would rise. And you could also, um, you could still maintain the surface water is what we did in this assumption. Okay, so the other, next thing to do is to look at the energy. How is the energy being used in, the, in these uh, systems? We heard about energy for transport. That's sort of an embodied kind of energy. But here we're gonna look at the energy associated with treatment of uh, wastewater. And uh, this is uh, data compiled with the help of Phil and his staff. So what you see here is uh, the kilowatt hours per cubic meter of wastewater that are being treated at this treatment plant. And this was built in the 1970s. And the total sums up to about 0.9 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And you can see right away where the big, the big expense is. It's, uh, it's in the uh, incinerator right over there. Now a typical plant uses 0.6 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So if you took out the incinerator, which is about 0.5, uh, this plant would be uh, <coughs> excellent, Phil, <laughs> right? So, uh, and, it, and it turns out that the incinerator is being used to burn solids <coughs> that could be used to generate energy. Instead, <coughs> instead it's actually being, a, it's, a, it's a liability in terms of energy. Now this plant uh, meets the regulatory standards reliably and it functions very well. It protects the bay. Fish kills have dropped. 
Uh, there's been improvement in the water and quality of the bay as a result of this and other plants around the bay, sort of 40, 40 different plants, have had a huge impact. They did what they were supposed to, what they were designed to do. But they were basically built in an era when energy was cheap. No one even thought about greenhouse gas emissions, right? And so uh, the plant works. Uh, and, and, uh, and so if you're an operator at this plant, you don't, you don't necessarily want to jump into something new and different if, it doesn't, if you don't know if it's going to work for 40 years, okay? Reliably, day in and day out, okay? All right, so um, it turns out that uh, this I got from Perry's here. Uh, and Professor McCarty, uh, his, uh, um, he just uh, written a couple of important articles, I think, recently, uh, or him and a group in, uh, in Korea, um, on uh, energy and wastewater. And this one is a quote I thought was important. Wastewater treatment accounts for 3% of the U.S. electrical load, like that of, uh, similar to that of other developed countries. Okay. If we look at what's in the wastewater, um, there's um, a lot of material there that could be used for energy production. Uh, the combustible uh, organic matter is there. It would generate about 1.7 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. Those are, those are rough estimates um, that I made. And then the nitrogen itself, uh, there's nitrogen there, the ammonia, and it could be combusted too and produce some um, additional energy. So altogether, it's around two uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter. <clears throat> Now that then, if you remember the number I gave before, was 0.6 kilowatt hours per cubic meter for a conventional plant, a conventional plant. And those conventional plants are hardly optimized for energy, um, energy um, uh, utilization. So this is three to four times more energy than you need uh, to, to treat the sewage. So current practice, we could think of it this way. You have wastewater coming in. It's separated into dissolved organics and uh, particulate organics. And, um, and uh, then the dissolved organics are removed through an aerobic bioreactor, microorganisms eat it up. The solids that are microbial solids that are generated from that would be passed on to a digester, typically. Now this is like something like how the city of San Jose operates their wastewater treatment plant. They, in this case, you do get energy value out of the, uh, out of the uh, organics through the, by way of uh, the separation step. And you put it in an anaerobic digester and digest it and recover uh, biogas. Now, this um, also is an energy intensive. The reason this is energy intensive and uses this 3% of, uh, the energy, of the electrical energy is because of the energy needed for aeration. It's about half the, half the um, uh, 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 energy expenses of the treatment plant are due to this aeration step. Okay? And then the other part where there is some energy recovered is from this biogas and anaerobic digesters. This is what anaerobic digesters look, back, look like. I just found a couple here. One in Singapore. These are egg-shaped ones that are they're easy to mix. And then uh, some that I saw in Michigan. So uh, what's the long-term future here? Um, one thing you could do is you could say, well, let's get really good separation of the solids and the, and the liquid, from the liquids. And then uh, continue with the anaerobic digestion as we have in the past. Recover the energy. Another possibility is now to change out the aerobic reactor and put in an anaerobic reactor there. And this is what um, Professor McCarty has been advocating, and, uh, and he's been able to show that it seems to be effective. And it's been tested at, in, in many countries around the world, and now we're starting to see that it can be used to efficiently polish wastewater, which was th believed to be not possible. In other words, we can get very high quality removal or high, uh, highly efficient removal of the organic matter from the water using anaerobic processes. And that was previously thought to be uh, impossible. OK, so if we look at how we can implement these things, another way to think about it is in terms of whether we're going to do everything in a centralized point in the future, or will we have scalping capabilities? And I'll just show you what I mean by scalping. You could take wastewater from a sewer, like El Camino Real. There's a sewer that runs along El Camino Real. And you could pump the uh, sewage out remove the carbon from it, maybe digest that, the settled solids in an anaerobic digester, treat the water, and then use it for certain things like landscape uh, or agricultural purposes. You could remove the nutrients and uh, use those if needed. Uh, and then you could also remove the salt. And as you do that, each time the water quality is getting better and better and better. And so you can use it for more, and, uh, more applications. <clears throat> so you're adding value. Essentially, we're adding value to the water when we do that. And then we could also have local potential for local energy recovery from the biogas. So a future system, this is a, a sort of looking at a, a 
a grid for wastewater treatment, you could imagine that you have all those little dots or places where wastewater is collected and then the sewer taking it down to a centralized facility. We could put in distributed systems of some kind. Well, looks like I lost my centralized treatment plant down there. But anyway, uh, then you'd have local reuse of the water, so uh, small distances to transport the water. And there it is. Okay, came back. And then, um, and then you would have energy recovery, which could be at the centralized facility and maybe at some of the distributed places if it makes sense economically to do so. Okay. So another possible option would be microbial fuel cells. This is some work research we're doing with uh, Yi Shui's group. In, uh, and the student working on this is Meng Yi, uh, who's here uh, somewhere over there. There's Meng. And uh, well, actually, actually, this one is uh, this one I've got backward. <laughs> this is a uh, microbial fuel cells is Yi, Yi Shui with Xing, Xing Xia. And then the, this Meng and uh, Maro uh, on another one I'll talk about in a minute. So here's Xing Xia. And uh, so the idea here is you have a place where the microbes are growing. They oxidize the organic matter. The electrons travel around an external circuit. And then, they're, um, and then they're, you have reduction at the cathode. The problem with microbial fuel cells uh, is that they, are, they have drawbacks compared to anaerobic fermentation, methane fermentation. There's a, a coulombic loss. Uh, energy is not converted into current uh, voltage losses. And uh, the materials can be expensive. But in the future, there may be things that can be done that will change that, in the, especially in the material science domain. And so uh, one thing that we've been experimenting with, uh, Yi Shui's group, is uh, using carbon nanotubes and applying those. And uh, these carbon nanotubes on different fabrics or on sponge, a piece of sponge, they make the surface conductive, completely conductive. And so uh, this is exciting to us because that means that uh, you can get a very high surface area, higher power densities, and uh, higher energy recovery with these kinds of systems. This is a picture showing uh, the microbes, how they colonize these carbon nanotube coated uh, materials. And they actually have little, uh, you can see the little uh, wires coming out of the bacteria. They make their own little nanowires. I once told a group of students, I used to teach uh, about this, and the students were asked, how do the microbes transfer electrons to surfaces? And, and I said, well, they don't make wires. And I was wrong. <laughs> they do make wires. So this is just showing that they make wires, and you can see that uh, there. And uh, this is a coated sponge, OK, over here. And again, the microbes growing, microbe here growing on the coated sponge, transferring its electrons down to the, um, the network, the conductive network that they're lying upon, OK? So another process that we can look at is uh, currently the processes that are used to remove nitrogen from wastewater consume a great deal of energy. And uh, the reason why is just, uh, I'll just summarize it briefly. One part is that the processes take ammonia, these processes take ammonia, convert it to nitrite with some oxygen. And uh, often they'll go then to nitrate, that's typically what they would do, which uses more oxygen. And then to get rid of the nitrate, you add electrons to convert the nitrate to nitrite to NO, to N2O, and to N2. So all those electrons represent lost, you could think of them as lost methane, or lost energy that could have been, uh, could have been used. And instead, we're using all that, all those electrons, all that methane, that reducing power, is being used to produce nitrogen and get the, reverse the short circuit, right? Get the N2 out of there, okay? So this is a lost energy that could have been used to make methane. So if we can reduce the amount of electrons that we need, we can potentially uh, benefit from that. So what we've, uh, this is with uh, Brian Cantwell, who's right here. So, um, he, and, uh, and, and, his, and the student working with us is um, Yaniv Shearson, shown here. And what the, the idea here is that you use ammonia, we take, start with ammonia, convert it with microbes to nitrite, and then we have two different ways that we can convert it to nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is a very powerful oxidant, a better oxidant than oxygen. And so if you have enough of this N2O, you can just decompose it and it will produce N2 and O2, hot air. Or it can be used as an oxidant to burn the methane that might be produced elsewhere in the treatment plant. Okay? And you'll get a little bit more energy out of that by burning, uh, burning the methane with uh, nitrous oxide than you do with oxygen. <clears throat> so if you look at the conventional system, we have two moles of oxygen that we had to put in and five moles of electrons we had to put in to make it work. And this one goes, you use one and a half moles of oxygen goes in and two moles of electrons. So, and we also get a little bit of extra energy out. 
So there's increase in the amount of methane that can be produced because we, we've um, used le fewer electrons on this step than on this step. And we also get an additional energy boost. So overall, a 20% reduction in oxygen demand, 40% reduction in biomass, and a 60% increase in energy recovery just by managing nitrogen differently, these coupled processes. And this, this is kind of how we're thinking this might be scaled up. So you'd have a solid separation step, and um, part of it you would digest, and then the other part would go through these uh, processes that would allow us for, to have the nitrogen removal. <clears throat> so here's uh, the process then that would take the ammonia and uh, convert it to nitrogen, which is what we need to do. We need to short circuit the process. <clears throat> Okay, um, now I got the right people picture there among, sorry about that before. But uh, now another possibility is that in wastewater treatment plants that are located on the coastal margins, it's possible that we could extract energy from the difference in salinity between the wastewater effluent and the seawater. Okay, there's a difference there due to the salinity. So uh, we've been working with uh, Yi group again. Uh, they're on the material science side of this. And the idea is to have a battery that you can, with different kinds of electrodes, special material science issues here. The electrodes basically, um, you can have one that's charging, and when it's charging, you're flushing it with fresh water. Flushing with fresh water, and sodium ions are coming out of some of the electro ele electrodes, chloride ions are coming out of other electrodes, and uh, you're basically putting a voltage in, so there's some energy consumption during the step. And then in the follow-up step, you have a discharge step, so you have a battery that now, this is showing a battery that's been charged and now it's discharging. And you discharge when, this, when you let seawater in. And so this is an attractive uh, op uh, option for energy recovery. Um, this is a little setup that uh, Mung put together and he's been testing in a small scale. <clears throat> and uh, so if we look at how much energy is there potentially available from that, it turns out to be around uh, 0.6 kilowatt hours per cubic meter which you may remember is the amount that it needed for a conventional wastewater treatment plant to run it. So this is what's potentially available. Can we get it? Um, that's another question. Uh, there, is an, there are method we're using with batteries is one method, and it looks promising so far, but it needs to be scaled up. Another method is uh, reverse electrodialysis, which I understand they're already getting 0.3 kilowatt hours per cubic meter using reverse, uh, uh, reverse electro electrodialysis reverse electrodialysis. So this is uh, potentially something, as far as I know, has never been used at wastewater treatment plants that, ta that are on the coastal margins. So now solid waste. Um, by the end of the 20th century, there were about 13,000 landfills in the US. Now they're all filling up. 40% uh, of the volume is the construction debris and, and about 20% is plastic. And the plastics are accumulating. This is a team of people we have here that are working on that. We've been working as, uh, for a while now, a couple of maybe three or four years, I guess. And all these are different students and faculty members that have been a part of this effort. And um, so if you look at our current research, what we're looking at is can we take materials and disassemble them? And now, so starting with waste, essentially, starting with waste, disassemble the waste into building blocks that can then be reassembled into useful materials. And so we use as our building blocks uh, methane, lactide, and lignin. This group of people is what we're working on. And then we assemble them into polymers or bio, uh, composites, biocomposites. And this would be uh, things like polylactic acid, polyhydroxybutyrate, or bioplastics, and, and then um, biocomposites. And then you make products at the end. So this is a cycle for the PHB and methane. Uh, essentially, you, start, you might start at an anaerobic digester, or it could be a, a landfill like this one. Recover the methane, that's what my group does, and then we work on the PHB process here, making PHB. And then uh, Sarah Billington and Beth Satley working on uh, different aspects of, the bio, of either the biocomposites or processing of the material, and also um, Kurt Frank on the, looking at the melt rheology and issues associated with making foams and things of that nature. Okay, so it, uh, if you look at what happens in the end of life, these materials would go to a landfill like this one, uh, the Palo Alto landfill, or uh, in terms of wastewater, we also have biogas always being generated here from an anaerobic digester, so we get this loop, this cycle. Okay, I think I said that. Okay, now, um, 
So uh, this is uh, showing with dirty biogas. If you take dirty biogas, so Eric Sundstrom, a uh, student working with me, did this. He went out and got some digester gas from the city of San Jose, landfill gas from, city, from Palo Alto, dirty landfill gas from Palo Alto, grew up the bacteria on, the, on this gas, and uh, measured the percentage of bioplastic by, by weight. And we're getting a, around 40%. Uh, by weight. And some experiments were getting 50 or more, but this experiment, 40%, and it was even better than the synthetic clean biogas that we uh, provided them. So it seems that this is a way of uh, creating a, a high value product from the biogas. So once you have the product, you can add more to it. You can add more value to it. You can, uh, you can take the PHB powder that comes from breaking, up the, breaking open the organisms and purifying that, uh, that, the polymer out of them. And you can put it into with uh, hemp or um, burlap, uh, material like that, and create biocomposites. That, uh, Sarah Billington sort of leads this effort, and she's, uh, she always refers to the hot press as a panini press. And then uh, you get a biocomposite here, something like that. Very nice looking materials. And they're uh, rapidly biodegradable under the right conditions, but when they're in use, they're, they're just like wood. Okay. Okay, so if you think about renewing renewable materials, then we could have building blocks. We make these biopolymers. This is the cycle I talked about. And you can imagine that there's energy requirements for this cycle. So there's going to be energy required uh, at some point, and there's energy coming out. If when we break these bonds in these materials, like we do under anaerobic fermentation, and then we produce methane, we can recover energy from these. And we, can also, and we also have to invest energy, though, at different points in terms of the assembly of these materials in terms of their design and fabrication, energy is need, needed for those steps. So uh, what, if, what if we did this? What if we take the organic waste and we make, we make energy from a part of it? And then we can also take the organic waste and make biomaterials from a part of it. So we just divide it up. So we create building blocks, that some of which goes to energy and some goes to biomaterials. And the energy is used to help make the biomaterials. So this way, we're not having to import energy. <laughs> the energy is there. And we just uh, sacrifice a portion of the waste to make the energy needed for material synthesis. Okay. So if we look at a landfill, this is a calculation for a, a landfill near Sacramento. We estimated it's like 33,000 tons per year of methane coming out of the landfill. Yeah, it's sort of staggering. So if you have five, five grams of methane per gram of, of this plastic, you can make 6,000 tons per year. Okay. Um, you could also potentially, from the protein part of it, make even some animal food, possibly. That's speculative, but possible. And then if you use, let's say, instead of, let's say we have to use 40% of the methane for energy needed for this process, to drive the process, then we would still be making 3,600 tons per year. And it sells for like $4 a kilogram. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, 2,400 tons of um, animal food, potentially. Okay, if you look at a large wastewater treatment plant, 100 MGD, so this is bigger than, this is less than, smaller than the city of San Jose wastewater treatment plant, but you get an idea here that there's like 1,200 tons per year, potentially possible, of PHB production. Okay, and then a wastewater treatment plant has other, if you, if you have these things, if you do a production of a facility, like if you make plastic near, at a wastewater treatment plant like this, a large one, you would also have a lot of water available uh, for cooling, any cooling operations that have to be done as a part of this process. And um, so, for example, if there's a lot of metabolic heat released by the microbes when you're growing them, the cooling water is just right there. Okay. So if we look at uh, recycling of materials, instead of just thinking about recycling of water, it turns out with materials, you know, you can break different numbers of bonds. <laughs> Right, so the more bonds you break, um, you can start with direct reuse, just using over and over again a product, and then recycle it uh, where you just th melt it, or you can depolymerize it to monomers, or you can break it down all the way down to like methane and CO2, as we did in the case of the biogas. <clears throat> so there's, we have these options, and what we end up doing then is offsetting the demand for fossil carbon within a community, right? We're, off, we're reducing the demand for fossil carbon. Just like with recycling water, we would reduce the demand for imported water, okay? These are just showing some examples. The PHB one, the different levels of recycling for the polyhydroxybutyrate, and, uh, and also the different, and they, when you think about more bonds broken, there's a possibility of then of recovering energy from those. And then there's also the polylactic acid. 
So if we look at integrated resource recovery, um, we could imagine a wastewater coming in. We have anaerobic digestion. Uh, we produce um, biogas, for example. We can make energy from that. We can make materials, potentially animal food. Solid organic waste can likewise be converted through similar processes. Uh, we could recover energy uh, at other places in this process here from the treatment of the um, clean water or the uh, primary treated water. And we can recover potentially nitrogen. We can even use the nitrogen for some energy production as, we just, as I show with, showed with the can-do process. And then at the end, it's also even maybe possible to get energy out of the uh, wastewater when it's discharged to the ocean, for example, or using heat pumps. It could be used to extract energy that way. And then uh, lastly, the water itself as a resource could be used to help with cooling operations and things of that nature in, in, uh, in, t in, the c in connection with energy. So uh, using waste as a feedstock, can we get this? Can we get energy out equal to energy in? This is the last slide. And uh, can high quality water be produced uh, with wastewater as the sole, so sole source of energy? Is that possible? Okay. And I think um, maybe it is. And then the other one is high, high value bi biomaterials. Can we make them? Can we produce them with waste as the sole source of energy and carbon? Okay. So these would be really sustainable systems uh, for, uh, and support local economies. Okay, and I need to always support, indicate the support from the Woods Institute and uh, uh, the City of Palo Alto and Stanford Utilities. Uh, Cal EPA has helped us, and now most recently uh, the center that Dick represents, or it's Dick, there he is, NSF Center, uh, Renew It, Renewing the Nation's Urban Water Infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Question around gasification technology and any innovation that's being commercialized there. Uh, can you talk about plasma arc gasification or other interesting gasification technology? I don't know anything about plasma arc. Um, but you know what's interesting to me on that side, in the wastewater side of gasification, is the um, is the opportunities of, of of getting water out more efficiently, which is a key energy. Uh, loss in the gasification process is the, is the water. So there are some in interesting new processes for water removal from wastewater streams. And so I think that's a place where there could be a, a breakthrough there. All right, uh, more questions. I think we have one. Yeah, how about you, Yeah, I find these uh, technologies really exciting. I'm wondering how many people are working on these kinds of things and what's the prospect of buy-in? You want to answer first? Uh, how many people are working in all these different technologies? I'd say there's uh, quite a group uh, working on these different technologies and different ideas. Uh, I think what's maybe special about us here at Stanford, if I can speak as a proud parent, uh, is that we're taking a broad view of things. We're looking at engineered systems of the kind that Craig talked about. We're looking at natural systems like uh, better understand the performance of wetlands as how they may be a part of our urban water infrastructure, uh, the opportunities for water reuse to benefit ecosystems, that one picture I showed, uh, great opportunities there, stormwater capture, urban source water, uh, urban peri-urban uh, aquifer storage and recovery. But the important thing is, is a little bit to what Craig alluded to and what I really didn't say, is how everything bubbles up and gets implemented. Uh, how is it that uh, the mayor of San Diego will reverse position and say, yes, we are going to experiment now with water reuse? So there's a lot that has to do here when we deal with infrastructure and water about how things work uh, that make economic and financial sense, that work within our regulatory environment, and that become acceptable to the public and urban planners and the like. So when you say are a lot of folks working on elements of this water. Well, since water is essential to life, I say yes. But trying to take this sort of integrated view overlaid by uh, systems and management approaches, I think that's what our team for the Engineering Research Center that combines Stanford, Berkeley, Colorado School of Mines, and New Mexico State. This is, this is very special. And it's the largest investment of NSF in the area of water and the only investment NSF has ever made in terms of an engineering research center on, on water. Uh, 
Um, how about we'll go back there and then we'll come down here. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question about the uh, City A and City B. Um, when City A is reusing water, is there some loss involved and uh, that would mean that City B eventually gets less water, like evaporative loss or something of that sort? Well, yes, there is. Uh, you can look at the water that's used outside for irrigation, for example. That's essentially lost. And that's where that number 75 uh, gallons per day sort of came from. It's just an average. Uh, City A and City B were not quite so hypothetical there. Uh, Big Spring, Texas is an example of a city where they're taking their wastewater now and they're putting it back in their water supply, co-mingling it, and then take it right back to the, right back to the city. So that's an example of uh, getting close to direct portable water reuse. Uh, and so this came, that picture actually came from a slide presentation that was put together by the city of Big Spring, Texas. Uh, so normally what we do in terms of water reuse is we uh, like the idea of a natural buffer, something where things may stay in a lake or the ground for a number of months. Uh, what's been talked about more recently is how to shorten that, uh, that time, uh, maybe use an engineered buffer so that we still get all the benefits of, uh, of sort of multiple barriers on our, on our reuse, but uh, now can do it with a smaller system. And besides, uh, if we put water in the ground, like there, I showed you the Orange County systems, all those different things, uh, that water meets drinking water quality before it goes into the ground, actually. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the NRC report, it's probably dirtier when it comes out of the ground. You know, but that's the way we are. Okay, yeah, thanks, just me. Um, one of the previous questions asked about buy-in. Uh, a few years ago, I bought a mutual fund specializing in water resources. Not been a great performer yet, but I'm still holding it. My question is, I'm, I'm recently transplanted from uh, Colorado, and water rights, litigations, and fights are just enormous out there. How is this good? How does this play into your, in your vision of the future? Well, um, this is why we have Buzz Thompson on our team, okay, a, a, a water rights lawyer. Uh, but things are different state to state. Uh, the, the thing that's interesting about California is an example. Uh, where do all the people live? Well, along the coast. So our, our wastewater goes to the ocean. And so there's an opportunity there, like here in Palo Alto, and you saw the big purple pipe system. You know, there isn't a claimant on that water. Uh, but, but you're quite correct. Uh, uh, when you are in Colorado, uh, it, is, it is tricky there. Now, it happens that Denver water has excess water. Uh, Aurora doesn't have quite enough. You know? And so what did they do? They say, well, you know, let's put in a system where we will take water out of the South Platte, filter it through the ground, put it in a reservoir so we know that when it goes into that reservoir and we pump it out again, it's our water. And the two systems together provide about six month travel times to the subsurface. Why six months? Because that's what they do in Orange County. And they pump it out of the ground, ship it 35 miles down to the city of Aurora. And that's one of the systems that we're actually studying in our center. So it's a, um, it's a water trading system. Aurora is saying, you know, uh, we will buy this excess water that Denver has, but we're going to put it and manipulate it in a special way that the water we take out of the South Platte is Denver's. The water we put in the ground is in, is in an engineered storage facility so that I'm not grabbing someone else's water. It's a little peculiar, but it works in Colorado. Well, I, I use that as an example of how things can be gotten around, but it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's just a very interesting system. And actually it provides a great research test bed to look at how the subsurface actually purifies water. I have one, oh, one totally unrelated. Oh, we, how about this, this lady here? <laughs> so uh, it takes a crisis, I gather, to get over the yuck factor. Is that what you just concluded? <laughs> um, I, I think it takes sometimes a crisis to um, get action. But what actually happened in San Diego was that the city doesn't have enough water to support all its growth. And the leaders of the biotech industry said, you know, if we don't have water, we're going to take our jobs somewhere else. 
And that got the attention of the mayor. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. All right. Now, what are we on the Stanford campus? Remember that red line I showed? If we go into a drought, that red line drops to where we are right now today in terms of our water use on the Stanford campus. And this is why people like Phil and Craig and the water department and are all working together to say, let's look ahead at Stanford about how we can reclaim our water, do it in an energy positive mode, show that it's reliable, show that it's safe, and that we're not going to contaminate uh, local groundwater supplies. And we're very fortunate to have tool, a dual distribution system here on campus, one for a potable water and one for our irrigation water. And that gives us a really great opportunity to demonstrate what's possible and scale up and meet our water needs on the Stanford campus probably for the rest of this century without taking any more water from Hetch Hetchy. Wow. Impressive. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was really fantastic. All right. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.